that was the Indo-Australian plate that's now two plates, the Indo plate and the Australian plate, mm-hmm. and it cracked in the same earthquake that caused the uh, Banda Aceh tsunami. So such things happen rapidly. And in fact, the more you research this, reading Hapgood and, and others, the, the information keeps pointing to all of this stuff occurring on a so, level of rapidity that is just going to be staggering. Some of these mountain ranges didn't take tens of millions of years to slowly upthrust, did they? No. The idea is basically that um, as the, um, the inner core of the Earth shifts, uh-huh. it causes the uh, cessation of angular mom- momentum in the same direction of the orbit of the Earth, and the equatorial bulge of the Earth flattens out. This causes the Earth to become spherical, uh-huh. uh, which not really. It's an oblate spheroid. It's fatter around the equator than it is around the poles. A key bit of information, too, in all these yeah. coatings, by the way. So are most Americans. <laughs> yes, yes. It's story. all gone horribly pear-shaped, as the yeah. Brits like to say. Yeah. In any event, though, so um, the inner core flips, and in the process it causes this situation where the equatorial bulge uh, flattens out. Now, that bulge is 26 miles total, or about 13 miles on each side of the planet, hmm. com- composed of... Um, seabed and in, in ocean and in, uh, land. Mm-hmm. And so when it flattens out, we're able to spin, and we do so in a series of, of jerky kind of little motions. And it's that really that is both the saving grace and the, the terror that we have to go through. But because of the way that it does this, the relationship of the continent to each other is not guaranteed to be the same uh, after the event as before. Mm-hmm. In other words, we won't necessarily... Um, sail around all at the same level. Some continents will come to a screeching halt, like, say, India or China, and then India rams into it really fast, and whoops, there's the Himalayas for you. Got it. Hmm. And the supposition, by the way, is that the it's feasible that the amount and range of the size of the Himalayas occurred over the course of weeks. It's also uh, the supposition that Lake Titicaca in the Andes Mountains was a seaport Right. And that it w- rose up to its current height of over 11,000 feet and did most of that rise in the first 72 hours based on the level of death in the local populace at the time you look and at the, the level m- of destruction. The major mountain ranges of the world, they generally are, are north-south. The Rockies, the Cascades, go down to they the Andes. They actually have a 60-degree angle that's consistent and, and, with that, And I was going to ask you, they're basically north-south, but they, they are... All sort of leaning, if you look at them, one direction or the other, I guess depending on the hemisphere, but maybe not. And that would suggest... An angular kind of momentum uh, screeching the, effect. The, yeah. Yes, and a, a sudden cessation of it, and things just pile up. Sort now, of our, like a slick floor, there you a go. carpet with no sticky yeah. uh, stuff so that you can slide, and then you hit that carpet, yeah. and when you hit the wall, it just kind of all scrunches up. Yes. What do you have in the United States to point to that would suggest that kind of a a carpet stack and thrusting a lot of vegetation maybe that's washed off the top into a uh, a compressed mass. We have we have several different things within the continental US that suggest just this. In fact, if you read all of the early literature of the explorers including into George Washington and so forth, they comment on how much of the landscape at that time, which has now all been changed, showed the signs of great cataclysms. But we have for instance on the Appalachian some of the richest coal fields around, which is basically all of the vegetation from the Rockies across the plains that were just slammed into that particular area, ground up into a, a fine car- carnivorous mass and made into coal. What pushed it? Water? Looks that way. That's the supposition that Patrick Gurl has, because here's the idea. Or if we don't have water, excuse me, just yeah. the actual shifting of the crust could cause that too. Not that distance, it's thought. That's a long haul, okay. There's long run-out slides where it's just merely a slide effect that occurs, and uh-huh. they've measured some of these in Canada. And they go considerable distances, but they don't go uh, hundreds of miles. They might go 30 miles at the most. Okay. Um, so, no, it, it looks as though it was a water effect. The issue, too, is that the badlands here in the U.S. have been scrubbed out by water uh, uh-huh. in the... Um, Eastern half of the the Washington State and Oregon, you also show effects of uh, large water runoff causing uh, land sculpting effects and so on. So something caused that. We can postulate any number of things, but it now becomes evident that within this particular kind of a theory of a recurring cataclysm that involves this particular kind of a motion, this would be expected routinely. And basically what happens is as the equatorial bulge shifts, 13 miles of water gets displaced and has to go somewhere. And so it 
sort of starts trying to crawl up out of the ocean bed over the continents just as they get filled up. Hmm. And so rises to some considerable height, and then as the planet is uh, attempting to reestablish its uh, spin, bear in mind there's this there's this uh, fundamental law called the law of the conservation of angular momentum, and uh, and you can basically uh, exhibit it's exhibited every time anybody throws a baseball. The speed at which it leaves your hand is due to the angular momentum of the arc of the of the pitcher's um, arm, and so it's that arc that that creates that level of speed, and that's what we're going to encounter here. And as that angular momentum attempts to reassert itself, mm -hmm. the oceans slosh around a bit and go walk about over the continent. And <laughs> slosh a bit? Uh, okay. How big of a bit are you talking about? There, There's the rub. Okay, this is something that is unknown. There's a great deal of, uh, and I'm, I'm not through my research on it yet, so I, I haven't really formed serious conclusions on it, but I was educated as an oceanographer in the physical components of oceanography. And I'm familiar mm. with waveforms and all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I would dispute that the idea that you could get a mile and a half high uh, level of water under the conditions that Gerald states that may be possible. But even his work notes that the ancient history of all of this, from the um, people that used to be Atlanteans that ended up becoming the Egyptians, they wrote about it, as well as the Hindus. And there's, there's another thing that reinforces my opinion of Gerald. He never got into the Hindu myths or the Taoist or any of that, and that's my area of expertise. I've been mm -hmm. reading that stuff for years, decades. And so and that dovetails. That dovetails, exactly. I mean, mm -hmm. just to the same level of precision mm -hmm. on the mm -hmm. numbers that are encoded in there and the whole deal. Well, if, if water, I don't mean to jump all over yeah, this, but fine. if water were sloshing and surging over most of the land masses, half a mile, a mile, whatever, uh, they would obviously scrub clean the surface of nuclear power plants, 103 here in this country, and all the rest. Wouldn't it tend to turn the oceans when they resided back from whence they came into rather ugly soup for a while? There's, a there's probably going to be that, but then there's also other issues. Long that Maybe long before that, that is to say maybe months before that, uh, devastating earthquakes may make all the nuke plants melt down. Uh -huh. And we may find ourselves in a in a horrid yeah. nuclear environment long before this occurs. Sure. There's a whole lot of, of predictable precursors that should exist if this theory is correct, and we're actually seeing some of those precursors now. What you described of South America, or rather South Africa, is very interesting. I didn't know that. It's a huge trench. Y yes, yes. Actually, Jeez. in northern Africa near Ethiopia. Yeah. Yeah, and it's a, a whole new ocean that's being formed, and they know that Africa is splitting. Well, again, part of the effect of all of this has got to be uh, that it's a predictable level of, of impact. is not only things like the level of fertility going down, but, but a level of chaos, for instance, must exist within the magnetic structure of each and every one of the planets that can exhibit itself in a number of different ways, some of which will be uh, extremely deep earthquakes, uh, alterations in tectonic plates as the inner core of the Earth gets magnetically twisted all around, very similar to the sun. Very interesting. All right, back in a couple minutes to talk more about this with Cliff. Glad you're along tonight. Not sure if you are, but we're glad to have you. <laughs> <laughs> right <Yeah>. back. <laughs> Let's get right back to our conversation with Cliff. You know, when you, we talk about the seed bank, we talk about Google digitizing books, and the one question which has always bothered me, although I think I've got a fairly good idea why, the continuing rape and degradation and, and destruction of our home, our planet. Why? Not one international globalist corporation, not one major government on the world is, is making any serious effort to reverse the looting, the destruction of our home. Not happening. It does not make any sense. No, no, no we, it's we not have logical. not organized why, ourselves appropriately. No, and, why kill the golden goose? Right. Okay, does this suggest that at some level, not, all, not all CEOs, not all court, somebody knows somewhere that this something very big and very unpleasant is going to happen, so what the hell difference does it matter? That's what they're saying. I don't know. Now, the other issue is Denver. Right in the center, what, two and a half hours either way from 
coast to coast, something like that. Uh, DIA is supposedly uh, linked to uh, underground transport that probably goes under the Rockies. And there is a lot of talk, has been for many, many years, about a very large underground safe dwelling for special folk who could fly in within two and a half hours, go into an underground transport at the airport, and be, shall we say, secure? I don't know. You got a mile and a half of water running over you. You got mountain ranges displaced. Who knows? I don't. I don't have the answers. Even if it's localized, uh, four hundred yard tsunamis running over a you know a hundred square miles. It doesn't matter. It's not going to be that simple. But the the dist- isn't it ninety percent of the world's populous cliff yeah, lives live on the coast the or, or very and, close to the ocean? Yeah, within thirty miles. Yeah, you get eighty five percent of. 